So, gosh, so glad to have my friend Dara here today and uh, excited for this training. And she has attended, she attended a parent cafe training in 2008 and has been involved with the Strengthening Families Movement ever since. Dara consults with organizations and systems that wish to authentically engage families and communities. And she's worked with several project launch grantees across the country, assisting with the impl implementation of the cafe approach and accompanying professional development, training, and technical assistance to enhance engagement and parent-provider relationships. Before consulting in family strengthening area, area, arena, Dara was a sales and marketing professional in human resources and pharmaceutical industries. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in education and social policy with a concentration in human development from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Thank you so much, Dara. We appreciate you so much, what you bring and what you provide to us and the growth that um, you bring to our county and these trainings that we provide. So welcome and thank you all for being here today. Take it away. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Leah. Thank you everyone for being here. I just want to start this morning with a little song and hopefully you will also join me in what I'm about to do. Drop alone if you feel like a room a without a roof. Move your body. Drop alone if you feel like happiness is the truth. Wednesday, how's everyone doing? Okay, I hope that helped get us in kind of like a sharing, happy mood. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, like I said earlier, just thank you for being here. Can everyone see my screen? Just want to make sure, don't want to assume. Okay, good. All right, good morning. So today we are going to be, uh, this is the first of five um, engagements where we will be just really digging deeper, diving deeper into the Strengthening Families Protective Factors framework. So today we will be really, we're not even going to go so far into the Protective Factors. We're going to talk more about the Strengthening Families approach. And then next month we will start really digging into resilience and then each subsequent uh, engagement we have will go through a different protective factor. So this is a picture of my family 14 years ago. I have three sons and a husband. Uh, my husband is Greg. My oldest son is Elijah. He is now 21. My second oldest son is 17. And the baby in the picture, that's Levi, he is now 14. So I uh, got a little bit of parenting experience and I really got into this work because of them. And I'll get into my story a little bit more um, as we continue. But I just wanna start with, this is, a, this is a framework that really we can be using with families uh, it's a way that we can be having a shared language, a language that providers and parents and families understand together in our work together. And this is really reflective of their personalities too. This one is usually 
he was so happy to get a little another little brother do you see how like he's like so happy and then my middle son i don't know he doesn't seem like he was that happy but um <laughs> He got over it, and uh, this was, and my youngest son was actually born on Father's Day. So I know we all have been on a lot of Zoom meetings, but I don't want to assume that um, everyone knows how to do Zoom. So um, if you need these slides around Zoom setup, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. And if you don't need these Zoom setup slides, we're just going to just skip them. So let me know, Beth, if people are saying do them or not do them. Um, and if not, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, someone is not able to see the screen, Jennifer. So I'm not sure. I'll, I'll text her or chat her and see if I can help. But I think we're good to go. OK, good. We'll keep going. Uh, hopefully, you guys know how to raise your hand. Because we have so many people on the call, we want to kind of you know, I may call on people. So, um, and I also might ask you just to physically raise your hand um, if you'd like to contribute to a discussion. Um, I'm just gonna ask that you be present, um, remove as many distractions as you can um, during this time and actually support yourself with getting a beverage um, or something to eat if you need to. I'm gonna ask that you get um, note taking uh, like a piece of paper, a journal, uh, you know, a pen, because we'll be doing a little written work as well. And then just to center yourself and maybe find an object close by, or if you're home, um, a pet. I know sometimes people have cuddly pets that they have. Um, and that brings you strength right now. So if you need to do that, please feel free to do that as well. So in the chat, uh, if you could just chat, what are you bringing to this gathering that you want acknowledged? So I want to acknowledge that we all have a lot going on. Um, what do you wanna have acknowledged right now about yourself? Um, and even though we may not be able to do anything about it, it's okay and I think healthy to be able to express um, these things the way that you'd like to. So go ahead and put that in the chat. What are you bringing to this gathering? that you want acknowledged. And I'm also gonna ask that if, if you have time and you're uh, able to, that you please unmute your screen from time to time. It's very hard as a trainer to do the training with a bunch of black boxes with just names, just being very honest. And also we're going to be going into breakout rooms if you are not in a position to contribute and participate while we're in breakout rooms, could you please put two asterisks in front of your name? Another thing is when we go into breakout rooms and people are not present, the breakout room doesn't work. So if we have people who go in who are ready to participate with four other people who are not able to participate in that way, it makes it very hard for us that are coordinating the training. So if you could put those two asterisks in front of your name, then we will not put you into a breakout room or we'll put you all into a breakout room together. People are bringing lots of incredible things. Um, gratitude, open mind, um, presence and participation, 30 years of experience, okay. Mm. <laughs> openness, uh, a lot of hope that times will be better, learning, patience, everything has changed. My mind is pretty splintered this week. It was important for me to hear this information. So I'm grateful for your approach to this event. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Mind Thank you. Enthusiasm, uh, bringing an open mind, passion and hope, Great. blessings. Yeah, lots of wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So I'm just gonna invite us all to take five deep breaths, however you wanna breathe uh, intentionally at this moment. You can do settling breaths, which means there's more, the count is longer exhaling than inhaling. Uh, you can do deep breaths, whatever you need to do to calm yourself and center yourself at this moment. I'm gonna give us about 15 seconds to do these five deep breaths or 30 seconds actually.
stretch if you need to. Been sitting down a lot during this pandemic. All right, so we have a lot of people on the call and it would take really too long for us to do introductions. So now in the chat, uh, let me know your name, your position and agency, and one thing you love about your job. So then I can just kind of look at that a little bit and just see who's here and see um, the kind of work that we represent all together and uh, individually and collectively to support and strengthen families. So I think the most important question on here for me is what you love about your work, what you love about your job. So your name, position, agency, um, and one thing you love, love, love about your job. And I'm kind of one of those people that I, I keep hearing the song after the song is over. So <laughs> if you keep seeing me doing like this, I'm still bopping to happy. Are you checking out the chat? It's really pretty awesome. Good. A variety of people. Ooh. Outreach coordinators. Mm -hmm. Family navigators, preschool teacher, program Out managers. So great. Outreach specialist. So uh, last week I did, a, we did a gathering on effective outreach. And part of that gathering, we talked about uh, reaching out. So outreach is reaching out into the community to bring people into what we are doing. And then also we talked about how if we are like a family resource center or a um, school or an early childhood center, how are we reaching out to each other and how are we working together to coordinate some of our offerings? So I'm seeing it's really nice that we have people on from all different places. And uh, it would be really interesting to have a conversation around how, to, how can we more effectively work together, especially now if everyone is hosting workshops on Zoom, could we collaborate to host a series of workshops instead of everybody hosting a workshop? And then getting fewer people than we desire? All right, thank you so much for letting me know who you are and what you love about your role. So now I'm gonna be asking you guys to do things every three or so minutes, just warning you. That's actually one of the tips to keep people engaged on Zoom. Every, about every three to four minutes, the facilitator needs to be asking you, the participant to do something to keep you engaged, right? So as we continue to do online trainings and gatherings with the community, we need to be remembering how, what questions can we ask um, what can we be asking people to do? So in the chat box now, please put your goals. What are your goals for this training? Um, what would you like to learn? What are, what are your expectations? And I'm going to be reviewing these because we're going to be together. Hopefully you're going to come to the whole series because all of this builds uh, on each other, just like math. You got to have those foundational concepts in order to do calculus and all the new math. Have y'all seen that video where they explain the new math problem and the parent is doing it the old way? And while the math teacher is still going on and on, the parent is cooking a snack, is cleaning up the kitchen because it takes so long to do it the new way. And the parent is like, just do it like this. Yeah, right? 
So these are foundational concepts. I just want us to be in line together. Yeah. Let's a lot of, Go ahead. Someone said protective factors and putting them into practice. Yeah. yeah. How do we operationalize this? Yes, that'll yeah. be a lot of what we're talking about. And sharing with their colleagues and families. Yep. Mm -hmm. So here are the goals that I would like to share with you, like what um, I'm going to be sharing today regarding um, each of these meetings that we come together. I'm going to show you the goals that I have and then implement and add in what you're expecting. So the goal of the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework is these three on top. Strengthen families, optimal child development, and reduce likelihood of child abuse and neglect. Those are the goals of the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework. Couched in positive language on purpose. When I first got involved in this work, I went to a cafe. If the cafe, had, if the flyer had said, come to this child abuse, neglect and prevention cafe, I wouldn't have went. I went because it said strengthening families. I also went because it said free childcare and free dinner. So if we're, this is a CANS framework. This is a child abuse and neglect framework. But we know that that's a very low bar. If I don't, and parents and caregivers don't see themselves ever as, as neglectors or abusers. But if you ask a family member, a caregiver, a parent, do they want to strengthen their families? Do they want their families to be strong? They're going to be like, yes, what kind of question is that? So that is why this is called strengthening families. So today's goals are, we're gonna list the five protective factors. I'm not gonna go so far into them because that's what each subsequent Wednesday will be about. We're gonna identify the multiple key strategies that undergird the protective factors. And then we're gonna really discuss about uh, why it's important to work with families from a strength-based perspective or lens and why we this will provide the positive energy necessary to do the work of working with families and how families see themselves. So uh, a lot of people think this is only for like little children and initially that was kind of the case when this protective factors framework was put together by CSSP um, they studied exemplary early childhood programs all over the country. Um, there were programs in California, in Michigan, in Illinois, in Florida. And what they looked for is these programs have lower hotline calls in these communities than other communities. Why? What are the programs doing in these communities that are, that are reducing the, the rates of neglect and abuse. And then they studied each one of these programs and they came up with the framework. And originally it was kind of like zero, five, zero to eight. But what we have found is that this is a, a developmental approach and we all need protective factors no matter what age our kids are. And so now there's also the Youth Thrive Protective Factors Framework, which is for youth. And they're doing work on extending the framework uh, into other uh, areas. And then also this framework can be used uh, to talk to business people, of course, educators, K through 12, and primary care and health settings. So it used to be we were thinking about this just as an early childhood uh, framework, but it really can be extended past uh, early childhood. So this whole work is predicated on four really big ideas. The first is to build protective and promotive factors, not just look at people's risk factors, because then we're not taking the whole person into account or the whole family. The second is that it's an approach. It's not a curriculum. So nobody can come tell you like, I'm gonna show you how to do strengthen the families. Here's the curriculum. It's not a curriculum in its approach to what you're doing already is predicated on a changed relationship with parents, which we'll talk more about. 
And it's also about aligning how we work with families, our practice with developmental science and everything that we know about the brain right now and how the brain is constructed, what's happening in those first five years and how we can impact that positively. So more on the change relationship with parents. And I talked a lot about this last week too. It's really about how are we building relationships with parents so we can do this work in an effective, authentic, respectful way. Um, so we're supporting parents' ability to parent. We're telling them you can, it's possible. Um, we're involving parents as true partners. We're sharing power with them in achieving outcomes that are healthy. We're engaging effectively. We are directly engaging and we are partnering with parents to design systems, parents and caregivers, to design systems and policies that work. So we all know that a lot of people who are designing systems that families find themselves in have never had to access that system. And it's very clear around the circles on a, in the hamster wheel that a lot of our parents are on because these systems have not been designed by the end user. They are being designed by the never user. So part of our work is to advocate that families and caregivers be equal partners in designing these systems so they are effective. So if I could just have a few people volunteer to unmute and either raise your hand or put the raise hand sign on to just answer these questions and we can put this in the chat too. What's happening right now? What are people dealing with? What conditions are parents and families in right now? So either raise your hand physically, use the raise hand tool, or you can answer one or more of these questions in the chat. In the chat. Oh. Somebody's no money, no job, schools are closed, childcare is not available. Work is cut, people are getting laid off. Housing is always an issue. Oh. Yeah, parents are dealing with huge financial needs and they're stressed. Isolation, overwhelmed, addressing basic needs, physical contact, being isolated, essentials are needed. So not only are parents, and families that we work with under a lot of stress, are we under stress? Are we stressed? Mm -hmm. I'm, I am a little. I'm worried about the long-term impact that this is gonna have on families and on kids, right? And so us being able to build relationships right now that can carry into when this pandemic is over is really important and that we be able to use this language. So how many of you have seen the TED talk with Nadine Burke Harris, where she talks about adverse childhood experiences? If you could uh, raise your hand or put in the chat, a lot of yeses, a lot of no's. I've seen a couple of no's. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. And this is, what I'm doing right now is setting the context for why this framework is really important and why it was created. So uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear the video. We can hear it. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, 
hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer, and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet, doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical; it's childhood trauma. Okay, what kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect, or growing up with a parent who struggles with mental illness or substance dependence. Now, for a long time, I viewed these things in the way I was trained to view them. Either as a social problem, refer to social services, or as a mental health problem, refer to mental health services. And then something happened to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go someplace where I felt really needed, some place where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center. One of the best private hospitals in Northern California, and together we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, there had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top-quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities: access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that. It felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health. And one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor and you see a hundred kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea. You can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, "What the hell is in this well?" So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, "Dr. Burke, have you seen this?" In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day changed my clinical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC, and together they asked. 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes. You would get a point on your ACE score, and then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking: two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. Sixty-seven percent of the population had at least 
one ace, and 12.6 percent, one in eight, had four or more aces. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between aces and health outcomes. The higher your ace score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer. And three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people looked at this data and they said, "Come on, you know, you have a rough childhood. You're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior." It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior, and that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic-pituitary-adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight-or-flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, "Release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol." And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear. <laughs> But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night, and this system is activated over and over and over again, and it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function; they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So, for me. This information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, then as doctors, it is our job to use this science for prevention and treatment. That's what we do. So in San Francisco, we created the Center for Youth Wellness to prevent. Screen and heal the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. We started simply with routine screening of every one of our kids at their regular physical, because I know that if my patient has an ACE score of four, she's two and a half times as likely to develop hepatitis or COPD. She's four and a half times as likely to become depressed, and she's 12 times as likely to attempt to take her own life 
as my patient with zero ACEs. I know that when she's in my exam room. For our patients who do screen positive, we have a multidisciplinary treatment team that works to reduce the dose of adversity and treat symptoms using best practices, including home visits, care coordination, mental health care, nutrition, holistic interventions, and yes, medication when necessary. But we also educate parents about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress the same way you would for covering electrical outlets or lead poisoning. And we tailor the care of our asthmatics and our diabetics in a way that recognizes that they may need more aggressive treatment given the changes to their hormonal and immune systems. So the other thing that happens when you understand this science is that you want to shout it from the rooftops because this isn't just an issue for kids in Bayview. I figured the minute that everybody else heard about this, it would be routine screening, multidisciplinary treatment teams, and it would be a race to the most effective clinical treatment protocols. Yeah, that did not happen. <laughs> and that was a huge learning for me. What I had thought of as simply best clinical practice, I now understand to be a movement. In the words of Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. And for a lot of people, that's a terrifying prospect. The scope and scale of the problem seems so large that it feels overwhelming to think about how we might approach it. But for me, that's actually where the hope lies. Because when we have the right framework, when we recognize this to be a public health crisis, then we can begin to use the right toolkit to come up with solutions. From tobacco to lead poisoning to HIV AIDS, the United States actually has quite a strong track record with addressing public health problems. But replicating those successes with ACEs and toxic stress is going to take determination and commitment. And when I look at what our nation's response has been so far, I wonder, why haven't we taken this more seriously? You know, at first, I thought that we marginalized the issue because it doesn't apply to us, right? That's an issue for those kids in those neighborhoods, which is weird because the data doesn't bear that out. The original ACEs study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But then, the more I talk to folks, I'm beginning to think that maybe I had it completely backwards. If I were to ask how many people in this room grew up with a family member who suffered from mental illness, I bet a few hands would go up. And then if I were to ask how many folks had a parent who maybe drank too much or who really believed that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child, I bet a few more hands would go up. Even in this room, this is an issue that touches many of us. And I'm beginning to believe that we marginalize the issue because it does apply to us. Maybe it's easier to see in other zip codes because we don't want to look at it. We'd rather be sick. Fortunately, scientific advances and, frankly, economic realities make that option less viable every day. The science is clear. Early adversity dramatically affects health across the lifetime. Today, we are beginning to understand how to interrupt the progression from early adversity to disease and early death. And 30 years from now, the child who has a high ACE score and whose behavioral symptoms go unrecognized, whose asthma management is not connected, and who goes on to develop high blood pressure and early heart disease or cancer, 
will be just as anomalous as a six-month mortality from HIV AIDS. People will look at that situation and say, what the heck happened there? This is treatable. This is beatable. The single most important thing that we need today is the courage to look this problem in the face and say, this is real and this is all of us. I believe that we are the movement. Thank you. Thoughts? If you've seen this before, uh, that's thank you for watching it over. If this is your first time watching this, you might have a lot going on in your mind. But uh, if anyone would like to unmute, just kind of, you can do that at this moment and just kind of respond if you like to uh, around thoughts about this video, what you just heard. Don't be shy. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, you know, I watched this video before and I did write it in the chat, but every time I see it again, it just speaks over and over again. So it's a great way to bring awareness about AIDS. And I feel like it makes it very cool. And she's very persuasive about um, her speech and the importance of mental health. Like that. Mm -hmm. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Annette. Who else? There's a Hello. lot going. Go ahead. Hello, Lara. Hi. If I get my video started, um, a friend of mine recently mentioned or asked me why black people end up engaging in a lot of um, inappropriate behavior or poor health related things. And I didn't really have a great answer. Um, and I have seen this video before and I've attended some of your workshops and I just re was reminded about the ACEs again um, and how that does play a huge factor um, in our adult lives based off of those experiences we had as youth. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the work around ACEs has not stopped um, in Philadelphia and I can find this to send to you later. But in Philadelphia, they've done additional work on how um, being Black uh, contributes to the A score and that how um, this study was on mostly white people who had insurance. Right. So if this is happening to mostly white people who have insurance, what is happening in black and brown communities, right? And so they've done a lot of work and I can't remember who it is, but I will find it out and I'll send that information to you. But I think what, what is so great for me about this video is there a scientific explanation for why certain populations of people have higher rates of diabetes higher rates of cancer, higher rates of high blood pressure. So I'm at risk for some of these things, whether I engage in high risk behavior or not. I don't, but I'm still at higher risk. There's diabetes on both sides of my family. Skinny people have it too. And so it's because of this continuing activation is why I'm at higher risk. So I was exposed to this information as a parent before I even really kind of got into this work. Um, well, kind of maybe simultaneously. And so just a little more about me. My uh, father had a chronic health condition called sickle cell anemia, which is a very painful uh, condition um, where he was hospitalized often, and he was also depressed, chronically depressed. 
um, because he couldn't really work. Um, and he was also hospitalized all the time. It was just very hard for him. And he was depressed. So I watched my dad live a lot of his life in the bed. So I have an ace from that. And I have an ace because my father died before I was 18. And so the stress of not knowing whether your dad will be home after you get home from school, not knowing if he'll be alive when you get home from school, created a, a certain anxiety and anxiety that I still live with because that's how I grew up. And so these are like real situations that people are dealing with. And if we understand and we are able to give this information for family, it families, it helps them understand why they do what they do. It's like, oh, that's why I do that. Instead of being afraid of giving this information to families, but if we want to be given this information, we have to have good relationships. We cannot be talking about ACEs with families and not have a good relationship. And that's why building these relationships are so important. And someone, oh, oh, Beth just put in the chat around ACEs aware. So I'm gonna and stop if here. You, oh, go ahead. If you wanna send us the information, Dara, that you're yes. talking about, the new research, um, uh, we will be happy to send it out to all of the folks here today. Yes. So I'm going to keep going. This is just a recap of what she said. These are the 10. So there's 10 questions on the ACE um, quiz. And you basically read the questions and you put a yes or no. And every yes you put on, you get a, you get a one point and you get up to 10 points. But what this really does for parents is it really shows them like, the behavior that you have could, is connected to your experiences. Then the next thing parents do is say, oh my God, I don't want my kids to have this experience. What do I need to do to protect them from the experiences that I have? But then we have to give parents an environment. We have to provide an environment that's uh, judgment free for them to talk about these things and to talk about maybe some of the stuff they are doing that's not healthy. If we could also get that too, please, I wouldn't mind that as well. Yes, you mean the actual the actual quiz? The quiz and then a copy of it? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I can add that. So this is just a pie chart, of, and this is just really basically showing how prevalent uh, ACEs are. They're, they're prevalent. And this is the 17,000 study participants who were white, middle class, and had insurance and it's prevalent. And so as the number of ACEs increase, the risk for uh, unhealthy outcomes increases. And we already know that ACEs usually travel in packs. So uh, if you have an unhealthy couple or if you have you know, substance abuse, domestic violence, incarceration, neglect, that's four right there just and we know families, or this is our family. So we know how this goes. These slides will be shared. And you can also uh, have these links to do more research on your own around the study. So don't you feel like we need some good news after all of this kind of unfortunate news? Yeah, of course we do. Um, but what I want to propose is that we are part of the good news. We love our jobs working with families. We love our work. We know most of us that our work is a calling, it's a vocation, it's not just our jobs. So we are part of the solution and we are the good news and we let's start looking at ourselves this way. So what do you see here going, I'm skipping this, what do you guys see going on here in this picture? Um, either put it in the chat or unmute yourself. What is the story here? Looking at this picture, what is the story?
anyone? I, I mean, I would say what I'm observing is a home where the mother um, may be neglectful. Um, also looks like she's suffering from substance abuse. She's smoking while there's a child presence. Um, there's some drinks on the table, could be coffee, could be something else. It looks like the kitchen and the living space is sort of disorganized and in shambles. And the son is happy that pop is home, uh, maybe because he's the positive adult figure um, in that family household. Thank you. Who else? Yeah, I see possible depression. I'm looking for your face. Okay, I see you, I see you. That Otis, hey Otis. Hey, how you doing? Good. Okay, who else? Hi, sorry. I see after a long day of work, mom is relaxing before dad come home to take over a little bit. Uh, being a mom is like a lot of work, especially full-time mom. So she's just relaxing before dad come home and support her out a little bit. Mm -hmm. One more. <clears throat> yeah, this is Lorene. Uh, I actually see the same thing. Yes, the house is a mess. Um, but mom looks like she's happy and she's chilling out. Dad looks happy to be home. So does the child. So they look like a happy family to me. Thank you. So remember when I uh, showed the goals of today's training and uh, part of it is the change relationship with parents. So we can look at this. I could have I could have did this uh, several different ways and you can use this too. Um, I could have said, who would you rather work with, family number one or family number two? Family number one just moved into their new house right now. It's a total mess, but they're trying to get it together. The mom wants to stop quit, wants to stop smoking. She uh, has an appointment to get smoking cessation medication, and she's gone from a pack a day to five cigarettes a day. Um, they eat healthy foods, and they really, really love each other. And then I can say, okay, and uh, uh, family number two is uh, a mess. The mom smokes. Uh, the dad uh, doesn't really pay attention to his son. The house is a mess. They have kitty litter just out uh, where the kids can get to it. Um, there's possible uh, drug abuse or substance abuse. Um, there's a knives on the counter. And then I show this picture and it's the same picture for each family that I just described. So part of this is intentionally changing the way we think around finding strengths first. So when we look at things and we see risk first, it's actually because that's what our brain, our brain is always trying to keep us safe and keep other people safe that we care about. So it actually is pretty normal for us to see everything that's wrong first because we want that child to be safe. We want that uh, family to be safe. But if we only see what's wrong first, families see that we only see what's wrong first. And our energy is, you are doing a lot of risky things when we approach. So if we can just go like, what what's strong first? I'm gonna go the other way here, let's see. So strength-based theory is about looking at families through a different lens, strengthening families, seeing what's strong, not what's wrong, not ignoring risk, but identifying strengths so we can use that as a place to catalyze our work. If you just beat me down about what I'm doing bad about, there's no energy for me to do anything. And I found this with my kids, right? If you just tell me everything, can you tell me what I'm doing right? And I go, you right, you right. Yesterday I was having a conversation with my 14 year old. If any of you have ever had a 14 year old, you can say the sky is blue, they'll say it's red. You'll say the water is blue, they'll say it's white. And I just was like all the way up here with him. And I said, 
why every time I say anything, you say the opposite of what I say? He said, how come it just can't be that I'm just expressing what I say? And I just went like, have I been taking this whole thing personal? He said, yes, very much so. And I said, okay, he's not, he doesn't see himself being opposite of me, but that's what it feels like. But for him, he's like, let me just have my opinion. So we want families to thrive, not just survive, but how do we do that if we're focused on everything that's not right all the time? Look around your surroundings, look around on the videos, Tell me if you see anything that's red. Just look around your own little home office or wherever you're doing this call from. Look on the screen. There's, a, yes, there's a lot of, is there red stuff going on? Find red. Okay, now remember how many items of red you have. And when I call on you, you can put in the chat how many you found. Now, tell me everything that you saw that was blue. No, you can't look again. You already looked one time. What did you see that was blue? You don't know because you weren't looking for blue. So we find what we are looking for. If we are looking for strengths, we will find them. And some families is going to be harder to do than others but they got something going on. How do we acknowledge that and build from there? So if, uh, let's see, Miss Brenda, can you read this definition out loud for me? I assume you're talking about me. <laughs> yes, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Protective factors or conditions that I have to Get rid of my thumbnail because it's covering it. One second. No problem. Okay. Uh, protective factors are conditions that, when present, increase the health and well being of children and families. These attributes serve as buffers, helping parents to find resources, supports, or coping strategies that allow them to parent effectively, even under stress. Look at and, that definition. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Look at it study it, what word or phrase calls out to you, put that in the chat for me. What way, words or phrase calls out to you? I'm gonna just go in the chat and talk about, um, someone said that the, well, some of the strengths in that picture, there are toys, artwork, fishing poles, food and resources. People are putting coping strategies, buffers, increased health and well being, parent effectively, even under stress. I'm going to stop right there with reading them. Because that's the one, when I first read this or saw this definition, I was like, yeah, even under stress. So I can be like, no, I'm not going to parent today because I'm stressed. My kids would be like, are you serious? What? Like, we want dinner. Uh, they don't really care so much. I mean, maybe a little bit now because they're getting older. But especially when they were little, they weren't like, um, they don't really care about what's going on with you as a parent. They don't care about your past and your trauma and your stuff. They just like, I want, I want you. And I want you to do things for me. And these are the things that we're supposed to do as parents and caregivers. So this even under stress was like, okay, a kind of a wake up call. Because remember, I have an experience where it's easy for me to go into like a withdrawn place because that was how my dad coped. So it's easy for me to do that too. So I always have to be conscientious of that and not let stress get me to that place where I cannot parent effectively. So here are the five protective factors. I'm not really going to go into them because we're going to do that at a later time.
But when we have all five of these protective factors robustly operating in our lives, and for those of you who are not parents, you are part of this conversation because somebody parented you. So you can use your experience of being parented to contribute. So never be like, oh, I don't have kids. I can't really. No, no. Somebody raised you. You have an experience with each one of these protective factors. And a lot of times caregivers need to hear that because the impact of how I'm parenting, my, you might say something that might change how I parent because of the way you were parented. You might say something that'll give me like, oh my God, did that, am I doing that? or I hope I'm doing that. That's how that landed on you when you were a kid. So these are very helpful and your experience counts, even if you're not a parent. So we have parental resilience, social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete support in times of need, and the social and emotional competence of children. We will be going through all five of these definitions. So if you know about the protective factor, you probably just seen this uh, blue part of this logic model, which is basically the protective factors, but it's not the totality of the framework. The framework is this whole logic model that you're seeing. And it's, there's gonna be another logic model I see, uh, show you too. But if you really examine this, you are seeing that we have the protective factors, but you're seeing several things before the protective factors. So the protective factors are not the end all be all. There are other foundational strategies. And then we'll talk about concrete everyday actions. There's worker practice, program practice, and core functions. So what I want you to look at right now is worker practice and then program practice. And we have a poll. So read, I'm not gonna read these to you. Just read them for yourself. And then Leah's gonna launch a poll for you. I want to understand where you see yourself in your role. Do you see yourself more as a program practice person, a worker practice person, or a combination of both? So read those uh, points that are listed and answer the poll. Okay, so we see most of us uh, see ourselves as a combination of both. And I just wanna draw your attention to what this is saying in the logic model. So the program, shift organizational culture to see family strengths. That means what do your assessments look like? How do you do your assessments? Is it all about the family needs this, needs that, needs this, needs that? Uh, is there anything in your assessment, any questions that you're asking that speak to the family's strengths at all or what they like doing or what they enjoy doing, what their dreams were? Make policy changes to support worker practice. We'll get to that in a minute. And then implement everyday actions. So what are we doing very intentionally in our own everyday actions, not just for families, but do we have an internal culture that supports this strength-based theory? So it, it doesn't work if inside of our agencies, we only find what's wrong with each other and then outside of our agency, we're talking about being strength-based. That's just like ridiculous. I'm sorry. It's no time right now to be beating around the bush. Too, too, stuff is too serious. So things got to match. Is the internal culture match what you're trying to do outside of your agency and organization? So that's work and a shift that may need to occur. So on employee assessments, is it anything about the employee strengths? About what they do well, what they like to do? Dreams, how they can contribute. So now worker practice. 
individual workers have knowledge of the protective factors and they can help families build them. But to have to help families build them, workers need to have be building theirs. So you can't be telling me to do something if your stuff is all raggedy. Is your stuff together? Now we are all works in progress. I'm not saying anyone has to be perfect. I'm just saying, are you working on you? And if you're not, then you can't tell me to work on me. I don't care what is going on in my life. Um, change your approach to the relationship with parents. This from the you know top down, the bottom up to, and we'll get to this in our culture a little bit later around these boundaries and who said we have to have boundaries. That means you want to work with me, but you want to have a boundary. What is that? What does that actually mean? What does that mean to use the worker? What does that mean to the family? Can we talk about shared experience? Is that really being unprofessional? What is actually professional and unprofessional when you're trying to build relationships with families? If you have a brick, imaginary brick wall around you, how can you connect with me? And families, are, they, they feel that. Um, implement everyday actions that support families in building protective factors. So if you have a family or you're part of family, how are you building your family's protective factors? So this is inside, outside, inside, outside in every single way. Internal engagement, external. One of the things that happens when new approaches or new curriculums happen is people go like, oh my God, now, you, now they want us to do this. Oh, now we have to stop doing, now we got to stop doing this whole other thing we was doing. And now we got to throw it out of the window and do this new thing. No, not for this. Remember, this is an approach. You are already doing all of this. Now, if any one of you can come up and put this in the chat, if any one of you could come up with something, an essential function that you do as an individual or as an organization that does not fit into the protective factors framework, I will send you a $25 Amazon gift card. Think hard. I've been doing this for Oh, 10 years, I've never had to send one gift card. And I used to have a crispy new $100 bill and I would do this in person and I never had to give my money up because you cannot think of one thing that you are doing to, to serve families that don't fit in that framework. So you're already doing it. So what it is, is about being more intentional and purposeful about what we're already doing. So remember that logic model. It has strategies that correspond to each protective factor. And they are here, and this is gonna be the time for you to start writing things down for yourself. So respond to family crisis is a strategy. Value and support parents is a strategy. Facilitate friendships and mutual support is a strategy. Strengthen parenting, linking families, observing and responding to early warning signs of abuse and neglect, and facilitating the social emotional development of children. These are all strategies that undergird this is the second logic model I wanted you to see. So you see how all this fits together. On the bottom are the results that we want. Optimal child development, strengthen families, reduce likelihood of child abuse and neglect. Then is to protect the factors. Then is the everyday actions. Then is the strategies. So where we get to direct, we can talk all day to parents about, oh, you gotta be resilient. Oh, you gotta have these social connections. Oh, you gotta like, your kids need to know how to act and blah, blah, blah. We can talk all day, like talk, 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 talk. What do I do? You're telling me I need to have all this. How do I do it? How do I get it? 
that's what these strategies are about. So what I want you to do for like the next five minutes, and this can be like, you can mute your camera, you can mute your uh, mic, and I want you to write at least one thing that you do in each of these strategy areas. One thing that you already are doing. The point of this is you're already doing it. I just want you to match it up. And then we're going to use these things for each subsequent engagement because each protective factor has one or more of these strategies connected to it. So it's 1117. At 1122, be ready to come back and just kind of have this. Don't lose it, keep it. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on a piece of paper. But I, I would please ask you to come up with things that you're doing already to show this. So now, do you guys have your, don't put it in the chat yet, but um, you have your person. All right, Leah, so are you there? I probably should explain this to you earlier and my bad. So what I want to try to do is how many people are not participating in our breakouts? Looks like we have about 14 people who have uh, marked themselves with the double asterisk. Okay. So what you're going to do long to arrange everyone in the breakout space. So have your number together. We're going to put each of these uh, in the chat and you're going to go into the chat and explain to your roommates why you don't want to be this parent. Why you chose this parent not to be. Okay, so we're going to do this in a randomized fashion, which is fine. Let's only have about six people per Zoom room. And just go in there and you're going to answer these questions. Why did you choose this person? Was it a hard decision? So I want to make sure, let's do six minutes since we're going to have six people in each room. Talk about why you chose this parent and why it was, was it hard or not? So see you in six minutes. So how were those conversations? I hope everybody had a chance to talk. It was six people per room. So one minute per person to talk is kind of my formula, pretty simple formula. We just talked about how each of the scenarios have very challenging um, issues. Mm -hmm. So it was hard to choose because mm -hmm. who would want to be in any of those challenging issues with children and small children, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So who would like to share, who picked number, I need one person who picked four. And, um, and I'm gonna do this for each one. So whoever unmutes and start talking first on number four, um, I want to know why you chose this person and then I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions. So I chose number four. Hi. Um, hi. I chose number four because I myself am kind of currently in the position of number one. <laughs> so I already deal with that. Um, but I chose number four because it's two children, same age, and then not having that support can really you know, be daunting and very difficult for someone. Um, especially with, you know, having to be like in a wheelchair, or having problems, you know, having to take both children with you to appointments, um, not being able to rely on anyone to at least, you know, help you with one child. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty much why I chose number four is because I know some of the struggles right now, <laughs> just being with one, I can mm -hmm. only imagine two. And then when, you know, being in a wheelchair or having issues and not having that support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Who picked number three? Can you unmute and just kind of explain why you chose number three? I'm not sure what three would. Anybody pick three? I don't have I a did. number. What was I number? actually did. Um, okay. This is Lorene Pere. I picked number Hi, three just because it, it was, I was vacillating between three and four, but I ended up with number three just because of the sign of the times. Um, everything in the news, you know, so much happening with immigration, you know, the babies that are, com that are coming over that they're putting in cages. It's just, it's tremendous. It's, it's really, really heartbreaking. So um, that's why I ended up choosing number three. Thank you. And I can piggyback on that. I chose number three too, because uh, prior to moving to California, I worked in Pennsylvania. I mean, um, I worked in Philadelphia and then in another county, Montgomery County, and I worked with a lot of immigrants. I know the pain of trying to hide to live in the shadows mm. just because of ice and just um, with the social climate right now is even worse. So I can feel the pain of the father understanding that he's an immigrant, you know, and undocumented and trying to, you know, just support his family. And so that can be really, that's kind of like emotional turmoil for him to try to do that. So I can relate to that. That was why I chose number three. Thank you. Number two. I can speak for number sure. two. Hi, Imelda. Hola. Um, having a, a child with disabilities and having uh, the disease of alcoholism on top of that, a complete nightmare. Every scenario is a nightmare. But uh, personally, having a child with uh, many disabilities, can't imagine the journey with all the surgeries, all the therapies, Mm. Oh, but he will never, he will never hear, he will never walk, he would never, and then having to deal, it's a 24-7, getting respite through alcohol. Whew, I don't know who would be more disabled in that situation. Very, very overwhelming to even say any more. So, wow, all scenarios are, are mm -hmm. not as pretty. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I also chose number two. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, this is uh, Aaron Chandler. I also chose number two because <clears throat> not just uh, the fact that, you know, the individual is uh, struggling with you know, personal alcohol issues um, or uh, having a child that's got special needs, which is significant. But uh, because that individual is new to the city, I think is even more important. Uh, the rest of the people or the case uh, scenarios seem to, you know, the, the people seem to be somewhat stable and just need extra resources. But someone actually new to an area uh, has no idea uh, where, what the resources are, where they're at and so forth and so on, struggling with their own personal issues. And then at the same time, uh, having a child with special needs, I think it's, is uh, important to uh, get that person some support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if one. I could just oh, piggyback, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> if I could just piggyback off of what Aaron said, um, the fact that the mom is new coming to a new city community, um, to, to admit that you have an alcohol problem, um, I would think would be very, very, very difficult because she doesn't want to be judged or she may not even know where to go to get help. And so for her to have to, keep that information um, hidden or not let anybody know about it and still try to take care of that uh, special needs child. Who knows mm -hmm. if it's gonna sink her into depression and or take it out on the child, feel resentful. So that was why I chose number two. Thank you. Number one, anyone? I chose number one. 
Uh, the reason why I chose number one was because uh, I looked at it from the child's or the children's perspective of how much time, bonding time, how involved you are with the children. And not only did, did the individual have two jobs, but didn't have transportation. So um, that can add even more hours away from the children. Mm -hmm. And so that is very challenging, uh, especially for the children and having the bonding, um, unless you really have a strong caregiver, hopefully many cases they don't and the children are at home by themselves. So that's why I'm taking that position on that. Thank you, Otis. Anyone else want to comment on any one of the four? Hi, this is Sandra. Hi. Is it possible to get a copy of this, of the slide? And I'm saying that because I would like to read all of them again and just kind of tap into what my assumptions are. Mm. Oh my gosh, Sandra, we must be like right here because that's where <laughs> we're going. So yeah, they, like, they are in the chat right now. If you have, okay. if, if the screen is blurry, they're in the chat. So okay. I have a couple of rhetorical questions that also can be answered if you want. So um, did you make your decisions based on deficits that the people appear to have? Yes. <laughs> okay, so remember we wanna, and, and it's okay, but we also wanna look at the strengths that people have. Um, yes. What assumptions did you make? Thank you, Sandra, for bringing that forward. What assumptions are you making? I wrote down the assumptions that I heard people say. I just don't want to, you know, say them. I want y'all to say them. What were the assumptions that were made during these explanations or even mm. your own explanations? So not, I don't mm. want to just pick on the people who had the courage to unmute and say who they chose and why. I want to know, and you can put this in the chat, or out loud, what assumptions did you make about these parents? My assumption was based on living in the Bay Area and um, you know, my, my past experience working with parents that have that type of, those type of challenges. Uh, but you know, we always do intake and we do one-on-one -on -one counseling. So that is when you can take the time to really find a lot of the positive things and, and sometimes your assumptions, you'll find out that the things that you do assume is not really there. So that's why it's very important mm -hmm. to have those time, the periods where you can actually uh, meet with parents on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how our past experiences, like if we've been doing this work for a while, we might get into this kind of, uh, oh, I've seen that before. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I work with these kind of families before. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's like a routine kind of like you already know that family whole story hmm. because it's based on your past experience working with families who fit in this. Right. And then we can be missing things if we are not conscientious about bringing that forward or leaving that to the side. Um, anyone else, what assumptions did you make? when you chose your person? Okay. I picked the family where the mother had um, a disability. I don't know what number I that. wanna stop you right there. There's no sex on any of these. That's a, an assumption that was made. Ah. <laughs> so there is not one of these that says the dad, the mom, nothing. Oh, good. Okay, then that's an assumption I made. Um, but I think while having you talk about it, I think in a way, my I think my assumptions are how I would feel if I was in that situation. Mm -hmm. And stepping back, I did work with a family where the mother was blind and she had two girls. And actually, I think it was more me feeling, oh my God, I don't know if I could do this, but she was fine. 
she joined our policy council. She, um, when I finally knew how to be able to work with her and we did activities, she jumped in with two feet. The kids loved working with her. So I think I, I assumed it was gonna be really a hard situation and it really wasn't. And I think I did the same with this parent because I thought, wow, two kids and you're refined to a, a wheelchair and you don't have any support. I yeah. probably made a lot of assumptions, you know. I just want to just acknowledge that the universe is conspiring to put everything together for this training. Like you guys are just putting everything together in such a beautiful <laughs> way. And Diane, thank you for saying everything that you said, because it might be our initial response to seeing like if I was in that situation, mm -hmm. oh my God, I would be like finished, right? How do we work with families if our response is that, and we, we, oh my God. So do we know the resources that are there for a blind parent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we yes. know the resources that are out here for a parent who would be like parent number four? And if we approach parents with this, like, oh my God, or we already creating separation. Being a parent is hard. Mm -hmm. If you have everything going on, if you have all your basic needs mm -hmm. and everything together, it's still hard, right? So that is a place where we can always be connecting with caregivers. This is not an easy role being a parent or a caregiver. <laughs> so whatever else you got going on, we can talk about it, but that's a place of connection, mm -hmm. right? And so when we have these, when we make these assumptions and these decisions based on our past experience or our experience, the first time I did this, I was like, no way I would be number two lady. I have alcoholics in my family on both sides and i would just no but it also says appears right but i just saw alcohol problem like absolutely mm -hmm. no how do i work with that family if my own past experience is so impacted mm -hmm. by having alcoholics in my family mm -hmm. or drug addicts I have, i've had those in my family too mm -hmm. How do I, how do I do that? How do I suspend my judgment? How do I connect? So this is really about we're making assumptions all the time. How aware are we about them? Someone said that the undocumented number three is a dad. That could be a mom. Number four, she could, or he could be married. It doesn't say that they single. <laughs> Ms. Bob, Bobby, you want to say something? You got to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I, in talking about all the scenarios, I was looking at that. And the first thing we have to do is before you go and address anyone in either one of these scenarios, I think we have to just really find out where we are and put ourselves in perspective before we go and approach anyone and, and deal with what our issues are. If we have someone in our family that has a substance abuse or if they're alcoholism, we have to go and deal with someone. We have to take our personal feelings and put them in, in perspective before we can go and be effective with someone else. Because if we don't, even if we don't intend to, our bias can infiltrate how we deal with them and we can do it unconsciously just based on our past experience. So uh, in, in looking at the scenarios, I think the first thing you got to do is just kind of check yourself uh, and say, okay, before I go in here and deal with this individual or this family with this situation, I need to make sure I'm okay. Mm -hmm. That I am mentally healthy to go in here so that I can give them the best advice possible or the best resources possible without being judgmental, being consciously or subconsciously. Because sometimes when we do things subconsciously, we will make a judgment call and we don't even realize we're doing it because we have an unconscious bias about something. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to just really kind of do some self-talk if we have a sensitivity to a situation mm -hmm. before we can go and approach um, any client in either one of these situations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I'd also like to piggyback on that. Um, sure. uh, just as you know, equally important is also ensuring that um, we're aware, not just you know, of those things for the benefit of the client, but also um, for our own personal self care. Uh, because you know, there's things uh, such as transference and counter transference when you're dealing with clients. And um, a lot of those things can uh, weigh heavily in, in how we interact with the client. And so uh, what um, what she was saying is, is, is extremely important, uh, not just for the client, but also for the personal uh, health of the provider, because, um, you know, a, a sort of transference or counter transference situation can uh, significantly impact how we provide care for the client. Absolutely. And I just want to turn your attention back. So I'm not going to go back to this slide, but I just want you to remember back to the slide, the program practice slide. So the program practice slide is around shifting organizational culture, making policy changes to, to, to support changes in worker practice. How often do you get to talk about this at work? For those of you who find yourself squarely in the program practice piece of this logic model, how often are you providing an opportunity for the workers to have these kinds of conversations about the effectiveness of their approach, what they're doing? We're human beings, we mess up. Where do I get to talk about how I mess up in my work? That is part of the, pro the program practice. That is part of the shift that needs to occur in order for us to be better and more effective working with families. We don't get to have these conversations only when we come to a training with the outside person that's not even being sponsored by our organization. We have to have space to do this. So for those of you who are in program practice, please advocate, especially now when we have these additional stressors for these kind of conversations to take place. So let me keep going because we have seven minutes. So name it, claim it, tame it. When we feel that bias creeping in or if there's a family you just like oh my god I don't like that I don't like that person I don't know why be honest be like I don't know what's going on with me uh try to figure out like what is happening because I know you guys love every working you love all people let's put that to the side but do you lo love working with all people no there are certain scenarios where we just go like oh my god I just don't even want to deal uh -huh. So do we know who they are? Do we dig a little reflective practice? Thank you. Dig a little into that about like, why don't I want to do this? What da, 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 da. Do we have somebody safe we could talk to that says like, I don't know why I get this feeling or any of that. We need that. We need that support. So one of the last slides, and then we're going to get to the summary, is um, culture and family strengths. So how are we considering these questions on the left, but let me just go on my little mini rant about this whole iceberg here. Hey, Dara, we yes. cannot see your slides at the moment. Oh, I stopped sharing. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Because I wanted to see everybody's face. Sorry. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. And I hope it's not blurry. So this is the cultural iceberg. As you can see, the bottom of the iceberg is huge. The top, the part that we can see is just the tip. And then we have surface culture. You don't have to take pictures. We're going to send this to you. And then we have deep culture. Where are we in our worker practice and program practice? Are we more surfacey culture-ish or are we deep culture? If we want to build relationships with families, we need to be looking under the surface. If we're up here at the top, that's all great and it's good and it's acknowledging people's language and culture, but it's not the deep culture that would help build a positive relationship 
we can have parades and when COVID is over, uh, what is it called? When everybody brings their dish and all that. We'll probably never have that again. So let me just forget about even saying that. Um, but what? when we're celebrating, is it just around these surface things? And how do we move beneath the surface? Have you ever had a family work with a family that's never on time? Different cultures have different aspects of time. I did a, 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 I did a um, training in Guam and they were like, okay, so training starts at 10. You know, you do the little pre-training thing. And I was like, so training starts at 10 and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, yeah, but we're on island time. And I went like, oh, okay, tell me more. They were like, so I said, so when do you think training will actually start? Because I'm coming from, uh, well, we will probably, probably start between 10, 30 and 11. So they still couldn't say like, oh, we're definitely going to start at 11. We'll probably, that's a time, that's a concept of time. And time is a man-made construct, right? So, but if you have appointments, if we have people in child welfare, working in child welfare, and you are late to your appointments all the time, that might equal some disrespect towards the social worker and all this kind of stuff. So it's understanding how these deep culture aspects impact the working relationship between us and the family or the caregiver or the parent, their culture to us, our culture, how we've been acculturized and just what, have you ever worked with a family where you're not even allowed to talk to the mom? You gotta talk, you gotta talk to the dad, only talk to the dad? And, and it is your thought about how do I get to the mom? How do I usurp the dad to get to the mom? Or is it how do I build a relationship with the dad in order to work with the whole family? Could there be some control stuff there? Yeah. Could there be DV? Yeah, but there also could not be any of that. And this is just the culture. Modesty. So how you showing up to people, if you a home visitor, how you showing up to people house? I probably wouldn't wear sleeveless to somebody house my first visit. Because in certain cultures, that's just a no-no. But do I know that? So as we continue to talk about all the protective factors, the approach that we take when we want to work with families in, a, in an effective way, we have to always be thinking about this. What is my deep culture? And what might the culture of the family would be? So we have the macro culture, which is my culture like that I come from, my racial and ethnic or maybe religious culture. But I also have my micro culture, the culture of how I operate in my own family. So these are all the things that we're thinking about or that we should be thinking about in our work. Lots to think about. One minute. So sorry. So this is a, just kind of a summary of what we did today. We listed the five protective factors. We looked at those strategies and you wrote down what you're doing. You're gonna bring that back. Um, we're, we're really getting to a place where we're talking about uh, strength-based perspective, strength-based theory, how we can look for what's right and what's strong instead of just focusing on what's wrong all the time. And we're gonna always through each one of our gatherings be uh, having these conversations on these common threads, the importance of culture, the critical role that parents play in building protective factors, and then um, understanding how all this comes together and creates these three ultimate outcomes that we want, which are optimal child development, strengthen families 
and reduced likelihood of child abuse and neglect. It's 12 o'clock y'all and keep calm. Mm -hmm. And we will see you, I will see you again on what day? November 4th is our next training. Wednesday and we'll be talking about resilience and I posted them in the chat so people can maybe copy that if they want and you will be getting invitations about the other um, trainings as they come come up you'll get a chance to register. Um, so happy you're all here we really appreciate that and appreciate you completing your evaluation so we know if we're getting it right and you want to hear more from Dara and um, we just so appreciate you coming today. Um, and we're gonna close the workshop. 